What I'd like to talk to you about is what is involved with an anatomic shoulder replacement, which we call a total shoulder replacement. Here are pictures, is it, uh, photographs and an actual model of what a shoulder replacement looks like. The critical components are the ball and the socket. The ball is supported by a stem and the stem fits snugly into the canal of the bone. The plastic socket is actually cemented in, and there are some innovations in this particular shoulder replacement design that have helped to manage some of the most common complications we have, we have seen in anatomic shoulder replacement. The weak point of a shoulder replacement has always been the socket, and so enhancing the ability to fix the part into the bone combined with using a type of plastic that has improved wear characteristics we hope to see lower rates of glenoid component loosening and lower weight rates of implant wear over time those are real innovations that I've been using in my practice for many years now but are featured in this particular implant on the stem side on the humerus side this is a short stem implant. Historically, we used to use much longer ones. And there are textured features along the, around the top portions of this implant that allow bone to grow into that metal surface as the metal surface itself has the similar porosity to bone. So bone thinks that that metal is actually bone. The implants that you see here and on the screen are DJO surgical implants. They're manufactured by that particular company. Now, my relevant disclosure that relates to all types of shoulder replacement are that I'm and have been a consultant with Don Joy Orthopedics, where I am sent around the country and sometimes out of the country to teach surgeons how to do shoulder replacement surgery. I've also been on the design team for most of the shoulder replacements that are being produced with that company including this particular implant called the Altivate Anatomic Shoulder Replacement. What makes a joint a joint is the ends of the bones are covered in cartilage. That cartilage cap provides nice smooth movement and gliding surfaces that cushions the impact between bones and allows you to move your arm very smoothly. Now as you develop arthritis, what's actually happening is you're starting to flake away that cartilage surface until the only, the, all that's left is the bone surface itself. Bone rubbing on bone creates lots of friction and irritation and inflammation, and that results in stiffness and pain and the symptoms that you experience with arthritis. Pain, loss of motion, clicking and grinding, these are all classic symptoms of osteoarthritis of the shoulder. Now when it comes to non-surgical treatments, there are not a lot of real good options when the pain becomes severe. But if the pain is at a much more mild to moderate level, it can be managed with anti-inflammatory medications like Advil and Aleve, which are over the counter, periodic cortisone injections to help calm down the inflammation, gentle therapy focused on stretching, and mostly what people do is modify their activities to try to prevent pain from coming on. At some point, the problem becomes so significant that the quality of your life is affected enough to make the decision that you'd like to go forward with a shoulder replacement. Now, I've never told anybody they need to have their shoulder replaced, but patients make their own decision based on how their quality of life is affected by the pain, loss of motion, inability to sleep, not inability to do activities that you enjoy. There are a host of different reasons that people use in their mind to make that decision, but the decision is yours, and when you hit that tipping point where you say enough is enough, then we talk seriously about a shoulder replacement. Now here's what's involved. The surgery is done over at Holy Cross Hospital, although I do select patients at our outpatient surgery center. The surgery is done under a general anesthesia with the addition of a nerve block. The inner scaling nerve block numbs the entire arm and typically lasts for 24 hours. And during that time, we can give you a variety of other medicines to attack pain from different pain pathways. This is called the multimodal pain approach, or pain management approach, 
and it has revolutionized the way that patients recover after shoulder replacements. I can now say that pain is very manageable after this operation and is not typically the main complaint after surgery. To do the operation requires an incision down the front part of the crease between where the deltoid or the shoulder meets the body. This is called the deltopectoral groove and it's a natural pathway to access the shoulder joint. Now there is a tendon in the front of the shoulder called the subscapularis. The subscapularis, the subscapularis needs to be moved out of the way in order to gain access to the shoulder. This tendon will then eventually, at the end of the surgery, be sewn back in place to allow it to heal. It is one of the rotator cuff tendons, and so it will require a period of protection, and we'll get to that in a moment. So once the tendon is released, the humeral head and any bone spurs are removed. The bones are prepared to match the surface and match the parts that are going to be placed in. And then the humeral stem and glenoid component are placed, and then the ball that matches your exact size are placed as well. And that is, those are the steps of a shoulder replacement. That surgery takes me about an hour to an hour and a half to do. The tendon at the end is repaired and back in place. From a recovery standpoint, there are three phases of recovery. The first phase is a healing phase. Now, during that six week period of healing, we keep the arm protected in what we call a shoulder immobilizer. You come out of that brace to bathe, to do exercises, and to change your clothes. Physical therapy is done every day. It's self-directed and very simple. Three times a day, you let the arm dangle, make circles about the size of a basketball, and do what we call a pendulum exercise. That will be taught to you by a therapist at the hospital before you leave. You do it three times a day, and that is your physical therapy. Now, there are things that you can do that are in front of you that are safe. You can release the wrist strap on the brace and do things that are immediately in front of you. You can type and write. You can cut and eat food. You can shave and brush your teeth and put on makeup. And those are all safe activities in the front of you. This will continue for a period of six weeks. The second six weeks are spent focused on improving your range of motion. We will be giving you therapy exercises as part of your home-based exercise program, and that is your physical therapy. Three times a day, you'll do stretching and elevation and stretching and rotation to work on improving your motion. You'll be out of the brace, and so you'll have free use of your arm for all activities of daily living. The only real restriction you will have is lifting and we recommend a two pound lifting restriction during this period. Once this period is done, you've taken it all the way to three months, now you're ready to regain functional activities. You can begin strengthening, you can begin to return to activities like swimming and tennis and golf and whatever activities you'd like to do, I only ask that you go at it at a very slow progressive pace and not jump right into the activity. This gives you a highlight of what to expect in terms of the appointments and how we will follow and manage your shoulder after surgery. Before surgery, you'll need to get a preoperative clearance by your medical doctor and we'll give you a list of things that are needed to achieve that. A CT scan is performed and that allows me to plan your operation. And now what I can actually do is take your CT scan input into software that allows me to virtually simulate your surgery pick the right size and angles and, and really um, prepare myself for your operation at the highest level. 10 days after surgery is when your sutures are removed and at six weeks we teach you the stretching exercises. We then see you at three months, six months, a year and once a year after. It's my routine to check x-rays at all of these intervals and continue once a year so that I don't get surprised by not seeing an x-ray for five or six years, seeing a problem and not knowing if it had been a slow progression over time or a recent change. Having those baselines for comparisons are very important. You can expect high rates of success with this operation. The literature is full of positive reports for shoulder replacement surgery and improving pain and function. When we look at our own database, 
of close to 5,000 patients and three, almost, almost two to 3,000 patients with shoulder replacements, our one and two year satisfaction with the operation rate is in the high 90%. It's one of the best operations I perform for people and changes lives and improves quality. I'm committed to research and my patients routinely will fill out surveys at all of their routine follow-up visits to assess how they're doing and it allows us to do things like this. So these are two studies that we published many years back that helped us to answer the question, how long does it take to get better after surgery? We learned from that analysis that pain relief happened very quickly after the operation. But function takes time, as you might expect from the period of immobilization and stretching, that functional improvements see a big jump at three months, another jump at six months, and then it plateaus off. Most of your improvement happens within the first three to six months. People do get back to activities like swimming and tennis and golf. And I ask that you don't start to do those activities until three months, but you should be able to get back to those activities gradually over time, and it is my expectation that you can be able to participate in them. I don't like to dwell on the bad, but there's always risk to any operation, as you might imagine. The overall risk of having a, shoulder, a complication after a shoulder replacement sits somewhere between 5 and 7%, and if you flip that the other way, there's probably a 93 to 95% chance that you don't have a complication. Things like infection, fortunately, are very rare. They're less than 0.1% in our institution. From a medical standpoint, the medical risks of having a shoulder replacement have been shown to be about half that of a hip or a knee replacement. Things like blood clots, very rare after a shoulder replacement. Unless you've had a blood clot or a high risk for a blood clot, we don't routinely put you on a blood thinner after surgery. Transfusions are extremely rare after surgeons after this surgery, and it has been a very long time since I've had to do a transfusion for a patient. The blood loss is generally kept to a minimum. Well, that's what's involved with an anatomic shoulder replacement. I certainly hope to be able to help you with this, and, and I'll be ready to answer any of your questions. Thank you.